played, it was going to come on for YouTube. You know, like you're not sure. Oh, yeah. You did your one. Oh, um, for the I turned the sound off. Okay. So, we're in the middle Hello. Hello. Welcome. My name is Jay Conteri, and I am the program chair of um, Low Residency Creative Writing at the Pacific Northwest College of Arts at Willamette University. Um, thank you for coming. We always have um, each residency. So our residency is January 2nd to the 12th. It's day four, but in residency time, it's day 40. So, um, you know, the days of the week kind of fall away. And here we are and um, in this amazing space. So I want to thank and let's give a hand to May at National. And yeah, I just want to thank you all for coming. And I want to thank our awesome students also. Let's give you all a hand. Yeah. So I am going to turn the, ma the Master of Ceremonies is uh, MFA candidate, Diana Oropesa. Thanks, Gary. Um, reading first tonight, we have Sarah Jaffe. Sarah Jaffe is a Portland, Oregon based writer and educator and musician. She holds a BA from West Ham University and an MFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's the author of Dryland, a novel, as well as short stories, essays, and criticism that have appeared in publications including Noon, Fence. Bomb, The Offing, and The Los Angeles Review of Books. Though mostly a writer of fiction, Sarah is also interested in the generative crossings between fiction and other prose genres. In addition to teaching at the Low Residency Creative Writing MFA, she currently works for its Justice in Palestine with Jewish Boys for Peace. Sarah Jack. Yeah. It's a little disorienting because you know sometimes when it's raining in Portland and it takes you so, so long to get anywhere. I just I'm so confused by how long it took me to get here. I like I could like feel like I could be in Washington. <laughs> I know that feeling. I know. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna read a story called Earth to You. And um Okay. Okay, I just made an edit in my head, so I want to make sure I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The guitars in the pawn shop are pegged high on the wall, distant as planets. Helen stretches her arm up and grazes the bottom of her bright blue electric, or no, as if she knows anything about what she's looking for. She'd let herself think that she'd know it by sight, and now she feels foolish. So cart before the horse, so not Helen. Then the counter guy is next to her. Looking for a good beginner's model, he says. He moves to the acoustics at the end of the row and lifts a small shellac guitar, hands it to Helen. We're no guitar center, the guy says, but I know a thing or two. Helen stands with the instrument. She hefts it, peers in the hole. Oh. She knocks once on the hollow body and hears the low hum of the string's vibration. She wishes she could explain about the sound she's chasing, volume and treble all crackle and spark. I was thinking, she says, and tilts her head toward the electrics. There's the blue one and a red one, an old one, and a neon green flying bee. For one of those, I'd have to sell you an amp key money, the town shop guy says. Helen is holding the guitar by its neck. She presses her fingers hard against the nylon strings. 
It's not like Helen, who shades anything. Okay, she says. When she opens her hand, she sees the deep, narrow channel of the strings grooved across her finger pads. Helen carries the guitar back to nature's direction in the free soft case the guy threw in. The receptionist goes deliberately wide-eyed. Do you play, she asks, in the whisper voice she uses when someone's in session. Not really, Helen says. She pushes coats aside in the staff closet to prop the case against the wall. I'll keep an eye on that for you, the receptionist whispers. Her voice brims with the generosity and affirmation one should expect in a place of healing. Thank you, Helen says, trying to leaven her tone. When she completed her certificate last month, her supervisor had suggested that she could work on coming across as more of a soother, as someone with an excess of work to give. After work, Helen walks with her guitar to the west side of town, where tall trees mute the minimal traffic. She'd found a flyer offering lessons on a bulletin board outside the co-op. Two pull tabs from the flyer were already missing, but she took as a sign of the teacher's aptitude. His house has a big wooden door with a knocker she drops twice, three times. Oh, hey, says the teacher. Sorry, I'm setting up in the basement. He's in socks, a teenager. I've never actually been inside the co-op, he says, showing her in. Is it cool there? What did he say for the lesson? $20 for 45 minutes? A half hour, I think, Helen says. In the carpeted basement, the teacher has set up a stool and a folding chair facing each other. Take your pick, the teacher says, or actually, he sits on the stool by a big square amp. Effects pedals crowd the floor like toy cars in a kid's room. His electric guitar is shiny and yellow, its headstock stamped Telecaster. Helen unzips hers from its case. That's a good choice for a beginner, the teacher says. Do you know anything about music? Helen takes herself back to the gray house on Stoller with the open window high on its front facing wall to the sidewalk outside it she'd stopped on, listening. Like what, she says. The teacher reaches over and pulls and releases the pad of string on her guitar. Like if I say that's an E, he says, does that mean anything to you? Yes, she says, hazily recalling a circle in the middle of the line. Oh good, the teacher says, he's already relaxing. He asks if Helen has an idea about what kind of music she wants to play. You don't need to be embarrassed, he says. I like everything, jazz, whatever. When she heard through the window, what pinned her in place, volume distortion, more shards than song. Her face flushes hot, her teacher is waiting. She says her favorite band is the Beatles, who she doesn't like or not like. The teacher says the first lesson will be all about how to hold a guitar. Because this Telecaster is a different shape, he borrows Helen's acoustic to show her the right way to hold it. He sits and holds the guitar and plays a pentatonic scale, wincing at the high notes as if they hurt him. Not bad, he says. He gives the guitar back and Helen holds it the way he held it. Your left thumb, make it more perpendicular to the neck, the teacher says, so you're kind of bracing it. It feels as if someone else's arms are attached to her body. She pays the teacher $20. Though it's late, Helen takes the long way home. She's never passed the gray house in the evening before. She sets her station on the sidewalk. As if someone had been waiting for her, a yellow light flicks on behind the high set window. An unseen hand reels the window open and delivers a cord like a boat with a hole. The sound sparks every point on her body. At the edge of the lawn, she's a pin on the map. The lawn is a plane and the sound is a loud line across it. The line reveals the distance between the open window and Helen. Because Helen is Helen, she doesn't let herself walk down stroller every day. She cuts through the park, strolls her lunch break on Cleary, occasionally takes the bus. She goes for beers with the massage therapists and acupuncturists. They're celebrating that one of them just bought a house and sips a stout slowly, considering the massager's body dips and cadences, how their voices stoke ease. The pub speakers are playing, hey Jude. Helen finds herself talking to a wren with square glasses. I'm trying to figure out the best sounds to play during sessions, Helen says. She's tried beach, rain, chanting. Her clients, unsocked on the table, eager to be unharried, tell her whatever is fine. Do you know, does the clinic have a music library or something? Music library, Ren says. The next day, after her last morning appointment, Helen went with the ocean. She walks past the park to the gray house. She unwraps her sandwich and stations herself. The window is closed and the house is silent and still, flying no possibility of disturbance. 
If she were bolder, she'd knock on the door. She'd wait on the stoop until someone came home and asked, what do you call the music that eats quiet? She knows that in college there was something called noise, clumps of kids hunched and fingering, twisting the knobs, but that wasn't this. There was no body to it. Helen waits out her lunch hour, one foot on the lawn. The guitar teacher tells Helen that she is now holding the guitar adeptly enough that he can begin to teach her to strum. She should hold the pick loosely, he tells her, but with control. He indicates his laconic pinch. He does some impressions of how she should not move her arm, first stiffly and from the wrist, next wildly throwing his shoulder forward so that he pitches from his stool. The proper motion, he says, is from the elbow, steady like a clock. The arm, he tells Helen, should always come down then up, whether or not she plans to hit the strings on both the down and the up sweep. Be your own metronome, he says. He suggests that she tap her foot. For minutes and minutes, he has her strum, tapping, advising her now to relax, now exert more control. She's not depressing any strings with her left hand, and the sound is murk. She asks, how do I make it sound sharper? The teacher says, for now, we're not worrying about sound. He gives her strumming patterns for practice. Next week, we'll try a chord, he says. Helen has a late session, and she takes her guitar back to work. She answers fine, ungenerously, when the reception is when the receptionist asks how her lessons are going. After everyone has left for the evening, she strips the sheets and sits on her table and practices a pattern, down, down, up, up, down. She plays the pattern over and over, ignoring the murk like a pendulum and not. She plays to the posters in the room, the ones left from the previous practitioner, the blue earth from space, a poem about geese, and her own map of pressure points. She focuses her sight on the point for the shoulder, her vertebrae, and she feels her nerves sizzle and prick. He's not home yet, the teacher's mom says. The mom wonders how old Helen is, but doesn't ask. Helen, sitting on the hard couch with a glass of water, considers leaving. The mom asks how long she's been playing. Helen says it's her third lesson. The mom asks if Helen goes to school with her son. I'm 27, Helen says, which is exactly the age the mom would have guessed. Pardon me, the mom says, you look so young. What's your secret? I walk, Helen says, her typical answer. Does she know the askers seek miracles, products, something they could find in a tincture or two? The teacher apologizes for being late. He smells like cigarettes. Check out what my buddy just taught me, he says, looking on his amplifier and settling on a stool, playing a flashy run of notes up and down the guitar's neck. We'll get to something like that in a few weeks, ha ha, the teacher says. He starts Helen out with an E chord. On a page in Helen's notebook, he draws a grid and dots it. Chords are shapes, he says. That's basically the most useful thing to remember. I have these names for the shapes in my mind, but you should make up your own. Two of the dots are on one line, one fret, and the third on the fret above them. Helen tries to see something in the simple design, a legless chair with its backrest reclined. What's your name for this shape, she asks. The teacher picks at his pick guard, tries to hide behind his hair. You should make up your own, he says. They're personal. He shows her how to read the grid and to pin her fingers on the strings in arcs so they won't move the strings behind them. The shape her fingers make on the guitar is not a reclining chair, but it is something. She gets it, a feeling, as a bridge describes the river it crosses. The shape suggests intention. She strums and the sound is buzzy and muted, presses harder and it's better, with her fingers more round, arcs her fingers more roundly and the buzzing takes tone. The teacher says he is actually impressed. Lift up your pointer and you get any minor. It's raining, but Helen refuses Run's offer of a ride. She walks to the gray house and stands on the sidewalk until the playing stops, and a hand she can't see reaches up to reel the window closed. There's a path she can take and she knocks on the door. The person who answers is holding a guitar that's so dark purple it's almost black. It looks a little like the Telecaster, but the model on its headstock paints it over. She's wearing a black t shirt. I heard you playing, says Helen. Was I too loud? I have no way of knowing. No, Helen says. How long have you been playing? I'm pretty much self-taught, she says, so forever, a few years. It's raining, she says. The house has gray wall-to-wall -wall carpet and wood paneling and a kitchen with a cutout window. It's almost empty, often vacuum. It's the house of someone without a job. I'm minimal when it comes to things, the guitar player says. Me too, says Helen. West takes classes part-time at the college. I should be working, West says. Helen has always worked more than most people she knows. Wes holds the guitar by the neck as if she might drop it. You play drums, Wes asks. Me, Helen says. Something skids inside her. 
Thank God he hadn't shown up with her guitar. I'm thinking just something kind of spare and messy about says, like anti-rhythm but steady, you know? Helen feels herself nodding. She knows how to breathe, she douse panic. West waits, guitar hovering, sure she'll end up with the answer she wanted. Yes, Helen has worked for the $60 she has so far spent on guitar lessons, for the $100 she spent at the pawn shop, but her work is satisfying. Sure, I can try drums, Helen says, if that's what you're looking for. Helen calls her teacher to cancel her next lesson. She doesn't give a reason. At home, she takes her guitar out of its case, sits in her sole chair, and stares at it. Now she sees that she did everything wrong. One guitar, no amp, and when her teacher asked her if she wanted to learn, she lied. She might have been able to answer honestly if he had put the question differently, something like, does sound make you see things? Or what is your current relationship to loudness? She closes the case, locks and closets it. West plays guitar in her bedroom, a twin mattress on the floor, a wooden dresser. Helen is surprised by how small the amplifier is. This little guy's a monster, West says. She flips it on and Helen feels and hears the meaty hum, the sound that precedes the sound. West picks up her guitar. Is it stuffy in here, she says. Would you mind opening the window? To reach it, Helen stands on an orange milk crate. The window's crank resists her pull until it doesn't. Between clients, Helen texts West. What music do you listen to? West, the radio. Helen, what station? It takes West an hour to write back. Depends. Helen writes, what should I listen to? No response after her 2 p.m. session, nothing after her 3. Helen prides herself on being present for her work, but all she can think about is that she's blown it, appeared too eager, too unformed. At the end of the day, the screen's still blank. Helen unpins the space poster and the geese from the wall, stuffs them in the trash. It takes West until the next morning to send a link to the 25 best riffs of all time. Then she sends a link to the 30 best riffs of all time. Helen would equally believe that West has studied these and that she has never heard most of them. She would believe that West has never heard of noise music and that she has a shoebox stacked with tapes, handmade covers, and a Walkman that still works. But as she walks or drives or takes the bus to class, her ears are never free. She doubts West takes the bus. The next time Helen shows up, West has put on the floor of her bath, her, put on the floor of her bedroom a metal pot, a box grater, one mixed up drumstick. West suggests that Helen keep an eye out for those thick wooden sticks from South America. No tambourines, obviously, West says. Did you say you were saving for a drum kit? West flips on her amp. She stops on her black distortion box. Is her strum metronomic for the rhythm she's keeping? For the current of the squall or the foam that feeds it? She starts out standing. She sits on the milk crate. It's choreography. She stirs up a massy rumbling, bends her knees as if to store momentum for a jump, straightens and stops. Is the window open? Helen puts down her drumstick and climbs on the crate. West sets her finger into a shape Helen recognizes as E. Coated in distortion, the major chord is wheat with sugar, the long, long, the feel. West hits and hits the chord, trashing its optimism, rending its cracks. She both falls back onto the mattress, just missing Helen. Helen, Helen, scratching the drumstick against across the grate. Helen's guitar teacher calls after Helen cancels the second lesson in a row. Are we cool? Helen waits to see what case he'll make. You are progressing, he says. I mean, really, it's slow at first. Some people say start with a song. Should we have done that? Maybe, Helen says. Don't you have other students? I tore those old hats off the flyer myself, he says. I heard it was what you were supposed to do. Was that shitty of me? We could do a song, he says, sounding young and desperate. You like the Beatles, right? My tastes are erratic, Helen says, trying to keep her voice down against the thin walls. She can hear a brook gurgling in the next room. Oh, okay, the teacher says. Erratic, with an A, Helen says. The teacher doesn't want to get off the phone. Helen is at work changing the sheets. It's hard when you're passionate about something, he says. The lessons were my mom's idea. Did she teach you, Helen asks. I wish, he says. I mostly learned from you, too. He takes Helen's silence as critique. Should I put that on the flyer, he says. Would you still have called me if you knew? I don't mind, Helen says. It's just hard when you're passionate about something, he repeats, you know? I think you probably know. What's your job again? Helen tells him. That sounds cool, he says. I think I could use some of that. You have, like, your own office? She books him for a session next Tuesday. West puts together a note, a chord, another, plays through the chain again, again, drops it as soon as it establishes expectation. 
She mangles ribs. She feeds them from the front end of her intention and unravels them before they achieve their first full cycle. West shreds ribs, kicks at the confetti. Helen knocks the mixed stick against metal. It's her job to stay solid and fortify it through repetition to create the background of ease against which West can flail locally. She knocks, she works, she walks, she sleeps, she listens. Each day she wakes up the same, feeling different. When they're hungry, West makes chips and salsa. She makes mac and cheese and frozen broccoli she shakes into the pot while the noodles are steaming. Helen eats what West offers. There's a six pack of Corona in the fridge. Helen is sick and asks for coffee, and West finds some instant and a single serving drip machine that came with the house. Helen is welcome to bring some coffee to keep there. After practice, after mac and cheese, West lies down on her back on the carpeted floor of the empty living room and stretches out. Helen lies down. The caffeine thumps in her veins. I never wanted to be president, says West. I never wanted to be an astronaut, says Helen. I never wanted to give, West says. I never wanted to buy a house, says Helen. West says, can you do that thing for my shoulder again? West takes off her socks and Helen kneels on the floor in front of her. The point for the shoulder is just below the pinky toe. Helen feels with her thumb until she finds it. She bends her thumb and presses, lets up, presses, lets up. She is opening the channel. Of course, West's shoulder burns. She wears her guitars blown low, and when Helen isn't there, presumably curls over her laptop writing papers. Down West's whole arm, Helen sees sparks. She presses. You might not feel it right away, she says. I feel it, says West. Helen's guitar teacher is impressed with nature's direction. I can't believe you're a doctor, he says. If I keep giving lessons, can I put on my flyer that I taught you? I'm not a doctor, Helen says. I knew you would say that, he says. He rolls his socks into a ball, gets up on the table. Helen hits play on the pink noise she settled on. It sounds like nothing, just held by the sun in an empty room. So if you quit lessons for good, her teacher asks, think about this. If I like what you do today, maybe we can work out some kind of trade. She feels for his liver point. My friend already plays guitar, she says. She needs a drummer. No way, he says. You have a band? You really didn't tell me anything. Helen senses her focused energy modeling. Usually, the pink noise coheres her. She lets up on his foot. I started taking lessons because I was standing far away from something, she says. I thought that was the thing I was supposed to get closer to, but what you think you want from far away is different because you can't really see what you're looking at. Who else is in the band, the teacher asks. You don't know her, Helen says. She takes classes at the college. What kind of stuff does she play? I don't know how to describe it, Helen says. Oh, come on, the teacher says. I told you I like everything. What's she into, country? Because the teacher appears vulnerable with his socks off, because she actually like, like him, she decides to try. She almost whispers deep evenly. You know how there's a kind of loudness that feels like it's breaking the air, she says, or it makes a different kind of air that not everyone can breathe. She has this way of shaking sound and, oh, okay, I get it. I think there's a name for what you're talking about. It happens a lot in bands, the teacher says, leaning up on his elbows. My buddy was just talking about this. I don't think so, Helen says, her voice too loud. Do you want to be it or fuck it? That's the name, he continues, unaware of the wall spinning, comfortably barefoot. Helen caps up the volume on the pink noise. It's really okay, he says, sitting up. I'm not offended. Anyway, I know the names of some good drug teachers. Helen doesn't charge him for the session. West has found another drumstick. Now Helen has no choice. West waits for Helen to count her in, even if she will soon demolish meter or forget it. West stops playing. Aren't you going to keep hitting the drum, she says. It's a pot, says Helen. It's a placeholder, says West. Are you still saving? Helen is always saving. She could buy a drum kit right now if it didn't mean that the money she'd spend on it would no longer be money saved. In her head, she tries something out. Would she buy it for West? If what her teacher said were true, is that what she wants? To unveil the hi-hat, then fuck on the floor? The problem is with the word want. There's something I like about the pot, Helen says. West puts the hood of her hoodie back up and stops the distortion box. Over the electric buzz, Helen clicks the sticks against each other four times. West's guitar creeps and attacks and fake flourishes, hides in plain sight. Helen knocks the sticks against the pot. Not hard enough. Helen takes herself on a date with Ren from the clinic. The sex makes her feel unHelen in a broad, finite way. She decides she does not want to fuck West or be her. Should she worry then about being replaced? Should she diagnose West as 
search of the spotlight, Helen becoming baggage before long? No. Helen, above all, is sensible. West may need a drummer, but she also needs Helen. No. Helen did not arrive on the lawn at the door because West needed her or because Helen needed West. West brought forth a sound. Helen heard her. I never wanted to be thrown a surprise party, says Helen. I never wanted to learn to cook, says West. I never wanted to be famous, says Helen. I never wanted to be famous either, says West. Is the window open? You must have nice neighbors, says Helen's teacher. Where do you live, West said, in the Hebrew Hills, in Wasp Hollow? We live here because we're free range, she says. We're free. Helen's teacher is over because they're been an emergency. West's guitar had been stolen out of the back of her Corolla. She'd been sure it was gone forever, but the next day Helen had had an idea. Remembering how the pawn shop guy had forced the acoustic upon her, she called her guitar teacher and gotten him to pick her up. They'd walked into the shop and seen West's guitar shining purple black high up on the wall. Helen's teacher asked to see it. After, he wanted to come with Helen to return it to West, and Helen couldn't say no. They were indebted. The teacher plows a chip into the salsa bowl. You hate the police is what you're saying, he says. Is that what makes you feel free? Have you guys written a song about that? Helen started a cool one about an astronaut, West says. What was the line about the galaxy? Your galaxy doesn't impress me, Helen says. That's so good, West says. What's bigger than a galaxy? <laughs> Nothing, Helen says. The solar system. Space is the best, the teacher says. I was definitely one of those kids. We all were, says West, but that doesn't mean we are now. The teacher balloon animals his face into a caricature of disbelief, looking first at West, then Helen, then back again. You're saying that if NASA called today, or Virgin Moon, you wouldn't drop everything you were holding immediately? When Helen and her teacher had found West's guitar at the pawn shop, Helen had asked her teacher to wait there for a minute, and she'd gone around the corner to the ATM and taken out $400 from her savings. Her teacher said there must be some way to prove it had been stolen, to not have to pay, but Helen had asked him politely to keep his mouth shut. It's easier this way, Helen had said. Now, the guitar Helen rescued is lying on its back on the floor next to where she lies with her socks and shoes on. Helen lets her hand sweep across the strings. Keeping her eye on the teacher, she says, National Asshole Space Administration, you couldn't pay me to go to space. Helen feels West get up from her chair. She feels the guitar slide slowly from under her hand. She can sense, as if seeing her, that West is slow slinging the guitar over her shoulder, walking over to the amp. Oh, tight, the teacher says, that little guy is a monster. What do you use for effects? West shows him the black stop box. That's it, the teacher says. I could bring by my fuzz face if you want to give it a try. Helen stands up. She's minimal, Helen says. Oh, says the teacher. She's right, Wes says. Stay if you want, but we're fine. The teacher shrugs. No worries, he says. He shakes out his hair as if he's settling in. All right, he says. Let me hear it. Wes flicks on her amp. Helen hears the sound before the sound. Later at home, Helen writes a text message to Wes. What is the loudest song you know? It might take an hour or a day for Wes to respond. Helen can wait. On the floor of her room, Helen has lined up a drumstick, a chopstick, a ruler, a hammer. She unzips from its soft case the cheap electric guitar, a Telecaster knockoff that she went back to the pawn shop and bought by herself, plugs it into the small box of a practice amp she also bought, turns the amp on and the volume up. She sits cross-legged on the floor and lays the guitar across her lap. She starts by barely touching the hammer to the string, then shakes it until she's making tiny taps, tearing up a warm hum that fills the room. The room contains it. She makes a hum with her voice that matches the pitch. It's more of a feeling than a sound. Thank you, Sarah. Um, up next, we have Jay Pontieri. Jay Pontieri directed the creative writing program at Merrill Hurst University from 2008 to 2018, and is now the program head of PNCA's Low Residency Creative Writing Program. His book of creative nonfiction, Someone Told Me, has just been published by Widow Orphan House. He's also the author of Dark Mouth Inside Me and Wedlock, which received an Oregon Book Award for Creative Nonfiction. Two of Von Terry's essays, Listen to This and On Naval Gazing, have earned notable mention in Best American Essay Anthologies. His work has also appeared in many literary journals, Gaze, 
Ghost Proposal, IRIN, Seattle Review, Forklift, Ohio, Knee Jerk, Tin House, Clackamas Literary Review. While teaching at Merrillhurst, Ontario was twice awarded the Excellence in Teaching and Service Award. In 2007, Ontario founded Show Tell, the workshop for teen artists and writers, now part of summer programming at Portland's Independent Publishing Resource Center, on whose resource council he served. He teaches memoir classes at Literary Arts. He lives with his son, Oscar, and Oscar's hug well. Please welcome Dave on here. Hi. Um, so many great sentences, Sarah. Uh, the one that's like in her head, she tries something out. I love that. Um, great reading. Um, let's see. I just wanted to mention, too, it's um, such a great honor to be teaching with this awesome faculty. I just want to thank the two of you here and everybody who's on Zoom. Um, it's just really amazing to listen to you all think. I've got that new Lana Del Rey song in my head. The only way to make a portrait, Joe Cometti said, is full face. I didn't see any, even though they were there, packs of dogs circling. If you see a deer, it means your big heart extends beyond your dinky mind. If you dream about the people in your life who died, it means you're a human being. If you pull the garbage cans to the curb on Wednesday night, the next morning, the city empties the refuse into their big green trucks. If you remove the oil filter from your automobile, you can fly your automobile to Kyoto. I've got that summertime, summertime sadness. <laughs> if you check your email, you stop writing prose. In dreams, I believe in possible things. I might even deem them within the dream impossible and still accept them as reality. I knew I was dreaming and I wanted to wake up, so I laid down in the wet grass with the hope that would bring my body closer to the experience of lying in my bed, sleeping on the verge of waking up. We form a sense of self. We form a sense of self to counter how little of the self we can possibly know. I hid beneath the bed so mom and dad wouldn't find me, wouldn't punish me. My mom said she was not amused by our behavior, and my older middle brother said she should go to an amusement park. <laughs> I touch with my tongue the way dull brown branches stripped of leaves meld into the gray winter sky. The chill you feel as you slip beneath the bed covers, where my body ends and yours begins. Separation is painful. I've been imagining my funeral again. Most of us just wing it. I want to learn more about the spiritual concept of grace. I want to learn how to speak French, man. Um, I have my headphones with me today. My love for my son in this moment swells. My son wants to be an airline pilot when he grows up. I believe my son will be one of the greatest airline pilots in the history of airline pilots. Mm -hmm. Thinking about, he doesn't actually want to be an airline pilot. <laughs> um, thinking about my son, and he would mock me actually right now. Um, <laughs> my son and his beauty tempers my thoughts of death. Although more than anything, the medication I'm taking tempers my thoughts of death. My oldest brother is an airline pilot. 
my oldest brother and my son have a very close relationship, which makes me love my oldest brother and my son even more. I love them together and I love them separately. It also increases my love for my middle brother too. In short, my love for my son spreads out to others. When our parents' friends meet my middle brother or me, they often say something like, now which one is the pilot? <laughs> we understand our incapacity to fly jet airplanes disappoints them. <laughs> People like to meet airline pilots. People <laughs> like to meet Oz behind the curtain. My brother once took me with him on his flight from San Francisco to Miami. I sat in first class and my brother pointed out various geographical points of interest over the intercom as if he were speaking only to me. My brother's voice seemed to drop from the sky of the airplane. In Miami, we went to a Cuban restaurant where I ordered some kind of fried beef and spicy black beans. Airline pilots and flight attendants tend to know where the good eats are. We are suddenly afloat on an underground stream, shiny and dark and smooth, mostly quiet, save for the sound of the tiny boat breaking the water. Hello, Hawk, come pick me up. I'm beneath the ground. I can't see a thing, only the slick skin of dark water. I wonder what my sleep number is. Biting my finger fat again. And those to whom I'm visible, I hold at arm's length. Another bad quality. You got it. Keep it out of my face. I want to know I didn't waste my life. The water is cold to the touch. Remember early Elvis Costello? Remember the jam? Living inside an incubator made me a living secret, kept from the world of touch. I was the size of a bird, hence the nickname Jay. Had I been removed, had I not been secreted away inside Leo Solette, I would have died. I remember the heat and the sucking sounds of the machinery that sounded different from the sounds mom's body made. I had been born, revealed to my parents, only to be hidden again which felt like a living death, and that living death saved my life. Remember your son's laugh. Oh, beautiful porpoise-like laugh of my son. Is it that I want others to know me, yet I don't want to know them? There's no such thing as tell all. At best, it's tell some. At worst, it's tell nothing. Remember to let your son fly you anywhere. Particle board. The punch was spiked with rum. I would carry a condom on me, but then not want her to think what I wanted was to fuck her. I was afraid to express my desire for her as if that were something to be shameful about, as if my carnal desire were violent, hurtful, an internalization. I don't button my sleeve cuffs, although that's inaccurate right now. I don't tuck in my shirt. I listen to the Walkmen on my Walkman. My friend EKF is capable of the big love. I fidget. I seem to be headed in one direction, but was really moving in the opposite. My red Schwinn 10-speed bicycle still hangs on hooks from the ceiling of mom's condominium garage. The massive cowlick, cowlick above my forehead. Ask me about grammar and mechanics. Ask me about who wrote what and when. Ask me to closely describe my emotional state. The Velvet Underground played the best way to cook morales by selling a ladder and cleaning the gut gutters clogged with wet decaying care about your fucking dumbass gun rights or how many deductions should we 
plant and which one gets lavender and how to fix a broken soul or what size batteries walk down to the lakefront takes early morning hours near dawn till we reach the shore and our part of the earth spun within view of our sun which is just really a massive fire burning itself out a cataract forming the clouding, the clouding the lens of the eye, your eye, my eye, the eye of the calm obliterated by anticipatory dread, by fear of human weakness, unwillingness to admit I fail in this life, I fail in this life. I try to do better. Say it with me. I try to do better. Oh, the static. Oh, the statistics. Oh, the stupendous duper. Oh, Sheila E. Oh, Sheila Hetty. Oh, Mary Shelley. I do not read lightly. I guess you pick up some things along the way. Ask me why we do things we know are bad for us. Golf clubs and skis and ski poles leaning against the cement wall of mom's basement because we can. That J guy is stuck in 1989. <laughs> that J guy carries his pug dogs in his arms and speaks in silly voices to fabricate, to fabricate his pug dogs talking like humans <laughs> talk. His pug says things like, you're my worker bee. Your face is so dirty, I need to lick it clean. I'm a pug, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Lasagna, lasagna mitts, marshmallow foe, the planet Earth of green olives, oolong. The Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Paltons change their minds about which interior designer to go with. Honk and wave the other way. The Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Paltons held a garage sale on the wrong weekend. Plod along. Get over things. That J guy is so. <laughs> I'm just gonna now. Um, I'm using been using this, Sarah. Um, you said this. Um, do some transparent facilitation. Was that the phrase? Um. Should we set up the, yeah. We're gonna do some setup, so we know each other for a second. Right. Um, also, I forgot to mention, but I have copies of oh. my novel from several years ago for Dal. Yes, actually, I'm going to mention also, um, if you haven't already, um, please, please um, support May in this amazing curated bookshop and, and also um, check out Sarah's novel, um, Drive Man. You just made like today. Yeah. There's a way, like, there's a way to change aspect in terms of like the shape, but not necessarily. I'm not seeing anything involving like there's color mode, but. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.
Should I start? Should I? Um, oh, we're gonna. Uh, Deanna, 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 Dean
Which is a thing which I don't know or at least watch always a giant, always a giant, always tell me they get your face that calls it to you. Like a slave, cold and plate, perfect distant. Porcelain regard, perfect acceptance. Break me, break me. I see you. Or, yes, I will, yes, I will smash the fear of my soul. But this is just the art of trying to be spared. A long walk with our child, covering the wind. As taken, I thou sometimes. For other times, for a rabbit, soft, furry, soundless. That type of suggested little creature, they just can't help but want to sink their claws into it. Yeah. On occasion, men have said things to me. Like an eagle, when I see a rabbit, I have to spit, snatch it up. I can't help it. It's just my nature. Or, the needs to explore what happens to me. And perhaps you have that tendency in you too. I don't agree. I don't disagree. Flowers don't speak. They are not expected to speak. Of course, flowers don't have mouths or voices. What are ears? You can hear the voice of flower on my pad of the day. Flowers could be flower constantly singing. In the same way that some insects have eyes designed to catch colors, human eyes can't perceive, can't receive. An alien intruder once told me when I woke in the middle of the night to express this by my bedside. Does my name in this body? These are just bodies. They're all just flowers. He said, I spent a lot of water. Just flowers, always singing. I want to consider that I believe in the sun and the flower. It serves to emphasize both the efficiency and the tragedy of wizards and. And that is the song, the one where the singer has his voice of the colonizer, who is both tormentor and makes a call at all devastating places. 
consider to cause things that we must lower the down to a particular matter. But there is something we must look for to the side of the path. It's like the flower in the position of the audience digression. And the digression exists only when one believes in a pandemic, which is that a right course of action exists very well. Of my bird of one land many years ago. I don't think I went from that very first year. And the way that the lady there changed at the power to be in the past. I know in and of themselves, the rest of the night. But they were sent to there by a large Um, just read a few poems from this section. Um, and these are poems that I read out loud often. Is that good? Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. um, and uh, before I came here, I pulled a tarot card. Um, for just for the reading, and it gave me the Queen of Swords. So I don't know if that means anything. I, I've pulled that before on some of these um, poems, or just some of these things that are working with. Like I, I think of like I'm working on one called Mother Wound, and I think of them as sort of you know being from a certain feminine perspective. But like these these poems in this book probably are the only place that the sort of theme of instrument is being considered from like um, a sort of racialized body and feminine body. Um, so I'll just read a couple of these. Um, table fruit. Once I climbed into a tree on the bank of a river on the border between two countries to pose for a photograph. This border lies in a desert or one might say the desert is a border for fever dream love. I wore a yellow dress, 
chosen by the white woman photographer who also had chosen me one afternoon in a parking lot. I admired her photographs, so I said yes, even as I understood it was my skin and indeterminate brownness I was well versed at inhabiting that made me the perfect candidate to fulfill her vision of a particular enactment of body in that particular tree on the desert river bank between two contraries. Sometimes juxtaposition is not so much counterpoint as it may also be revision. The palm fronds were long, dry, pale brown, laced with fine spiky edges. I kept my shoes on to climb into the tree then took them off and tossed them back down to the ground for the picture. I held a yellow bunch of bright bananas in my left hand and stared into the middle distance. The photographer already had the title in mind for this photograph, Table Fruit. Table Fruit, I am standing on the bank of a river between supposed two contraries. It is morning, November bright desert pool. I am wearing a yellow dress, river redreamt into divining line to covet indeterminate architecture of body, brownness, wanted. Yes, I climbed into the tree. Those fat, dense fan palms, imports also to the Chihuahua Hot Springs Valley and held in my left hand, supposed my skins, but I understood my role to allow others sometimes I am holding, I am wearing distance, countries, fevers, and indeterminate people, a yellow dress, bananas, the trick of the light or of relationality, I stood in relaviate really between two. This one is called The Refugee Porn Star Wears a Cat Suit. The Refugee Porn Star Wears a Cat Suit, complete with cat masks, because she, he knows. They want and love most, especially on the internet, those little or furry or big eyed ones. In the mirror, I practice having a waist because how will I get back home without one? It should be diminutive enough, that word, to make an average man's forearm look big and or saving limb like. And would you prefer me in the yellow dress or the yellow pantsuit or in dip bones? In truth, I have never really been homosexual. Um, in this one, just to give a little context, this one is about, I don't write a lot of poems based on like media, but this one is in reaction to um, just a viral video and the title sort of describes what the video is of. Um, it's from one of those like talent shows where people are doing really you know, spectacular things. But um, I kind of like had to think into it a little bit more. So if you Google this phrase, Vietnamese brothers balancing on head, you'll find the video. Um, and it's literally what is described in the, in the poem. Um, Vietnamese brothers balancing on head, or in which I question the laudatory retweeting of that Britain's Got Talent video of the Yang brothers balancing one atop the other's head as perpetuation of model minority. Is this a visualization of post war recovery, Dory Mori, as circus metaphor, or Emasculation vindication because I know how much Vietnamese men play something strong. But the Vietnamese body as spectacle 
as sight or impossible feats no one ever really needs to perform is nothing new. I would like to ask when has it ever been necessary for one man to turn upside down another, his own brother, and balance him with no hands, no less, on top of his own head, to walk down and then back up a set of stage steps, backwards, no less, clenching face and fists in exertion for the whole world to see. Collectivity, drug, weight of blood lines us into. And I'll just read a couple of these. This is called Q Reprise, and it's actually an erasure from the tale of Q, which is that really famous long narrative poem in Indian's literary culture. And I, I actually just took the first page and did some erasure, but obviously the English translation is like this. In this life, destiny shifts without women, leagues, old books. Men's fortunes shift, sick, the world. Women read to carry on. Nature, sick. Women read, love. The sea now, the last born. And I'll just end with flower diatribe number two. This is sort of response to the development. It always begins something like this with the attempted placement of one mouth over another. You waking to you as body, as oppositional territory. It's like there's a Ferrari, and I've never driven a Ferrari before, and I'm thinking if I can drive it, I should drive it. Or the one whose stray dog defecated in your closet the night you thought he was there to comfort you. You just have to ask God and the baby. But to the one who offered himself as an eagle and you the rabbit, that time you said no, even though he might at some point have written you a recommendation letter or given you a pen and parting so you could keep on writing. And so that on his end, when he took out his matching one to sign a document or contract or check at some future point, he would simultaneously send out to you a single thought, picturing you naked, back in the place where he believes he conquered yet gave something to you. A matter of country, always separate from his own. Instead, you wake alone. You walk out into a cold morning. You belong to no one. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Have a great reading. Thank you, Dow. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you, Diaby. Have a good night, y'all. Bye, little. Thanks for saying.